March morning, March the 14th, 1971, we as the Christian Witnesses of Jehovah of this congregation are delighted to be here. And we rejoice in having the interested persons with us also. The reason for it is because a special time, for 20 years ago, March the 11th, 1951, this congregation dedicated this structure to the worship and service of Jehovah. 20 years later, we're here. And to think that we're still a part of this great family that is worshiping Jehovah. But we had with us the secretary and treasurer of the society in 1951. He's in our midst this morning. So we'll be delighted to listen to a brother, Brand Suter, who is the secretary treasurer of the Watchtower Society, now speak to us on the subject, What the Harvest Brings. Today it is 20 years and three days since this congregation of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses formally dedicated this Kingdom Hall to Jehovah God on Sunday. March 11, 1951, and at that time uh, the congregation was joined by many other from this uh, vicinity, hundreds of persons in fact, and uh, there were a total of uh, 832 in attendance at that inauguration. Since the year 1908, when this congregation was organized, its uh, history has been one of loyally upholding the word and worship of Jehovah God in this part of the great field, the field of the world and uh, the message of Jehovah's kingdom by Christ Jesus has been preached and taught in this part of the field by his ministers in this congregation. That uh, history has been true. It was uh, up until the year 1951. And now on this uh, 20th anniversary of the dedication of the Kingdom Hall, we are thrilled in contemplation of the advance of uh, the work of Jehovah's people uh, throughout all the earth, not only in the area that is uh, the responsibility of this congregation, but uh, on every hand. Jehovah's people see his blessing upon those who, with loyalty, do uphold his word and his worship. They see their increase in their numbers, and particularly in his worship, and that is true respecting this kingdom hall and this congregation, but not here alone, but throughout all the fields. This uh, forenoon of the 14th day of March, 1971, the sixth month of the Jewish secular year, and it corresponds to our uh, modern February to March. Well, in the land of Palestine today, Adar is uh, bringing a season of frequent uh, thunder and hail. The uh, cold weather is uh, largely diminished and uh, the latter or the spring uh, rains are uh, just ahead of them. Agriculturally speaking, the uh, almond trees have uh, begun to blossom. The citrus fruits have ripened. The fig trees have uh, budded. And uh, now the uh, carob trees are uh, in bloom. The barley is ripening in the Jordan Valley and uh, the citrus fruits uh, in some areas are actually being harvested. And it won't be long until uh, the herdsmen move their flocks out of their winter quarters out into the open areas uh, because the winter season is ending and uh, spring is... Uh, right at the door, just ahead of uh, God's people in Palestine in years gone by upon this date, there was the celebration of the Passover. 
Nisan the 14th, which uh, this year begins at the evening, uh, 6 o'clock, on uh, our modern date of April the 9th. Yes, it's springtime. We know when uh, Passover comes or when, uh, for Christians, the time comes for the celebration of the memorial of the death of Christ Jesus. It's springtime. And uh, this being the case, and the uh, rains being just ahead of us now, the spring rains, and the related uh, activities in the field for the coming agricultural season being ahead, there uh, are abundant uh, prospects on every hand for a harvest, eventually. At the end of the agricultural year, a new agricultural year is uh, underway with its uh, eventual harvest, or certainly the time will come when this agricultural year should produce a harvest. And that reminds us of a spiritual harvest. And uh, then is our experience going to be that that is expressed by God's prophet Jeremiah in chapter 8, verse 20? The harvest is past. The uh, summer has come to an end. Uh, but as for us, uh, we've not been saved. Well, what do uh, harvest and uh, summer have to do with salvation? Well, very, very much in every way, because uh, if the summer is past and uh, the harvest is ended, this means that the agricultural harvest has passed, you see, or at least uh, the time for an agricultural harvest has passed and has come to a conclusion. Now just think again of the agricultural year. In the early spring, there's the spring rain. And uh, there's the harvest uh, thereafter of the barley. And after that, 50 days later, in fact, we have the presentation of the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and thereafter come the summer fruits, the gathering of the fruitage of the olive yards, and thereafter comes the vintage, the gathering of the grapes, and the, the treading of the grapes for the making of the wine, and this comes at the culmination of the summertime. So, if uh, the summer has come to an end, and uh, the harvest is past, and uh, we are not saved, it means that we've had a crop failure. The summer is past. You see, the harvest has ended, and uh, there is nothing on which the speaker who says it's past and I'm not saved, there's nothing on which he can subsist. There's nothing on which he can live, you see. There's nothing for him to eat, and starvation stares him in the face, and he's going to die because of a crop failure. So, of course, uh, uh, summertime and its conclusion and the end of the harvest or the coming of the harvest time at least have uh, much to do with salvation. And from the agricultural standpoint, it means he's uh, going to die of uh, a lack of uh, harvest, you see. Because if he had a harvest, he wouldn't say the summer's past, the harvest has ended, and we're not saved. So starvation uh, stares him in the face. He's going to die because of a lack of food. Well, is that the experience uh, that we are undergoing? Or is that the experience that uh, we are preparing for? The experience of a uh, spiritual crop failure, of which we're reminded by the literal agricultural uh, crop or lack of harvest. Well, someone is going to experience this uh, situation as stated here at Jeremiah 8.20. Well, who will do so? Well, who has claimed uh, a, a great crop of spirituality? Who has uh, made the claim of uh, world conversion and has attempted world conversion by spreading around the world Christian spirituality, according to her claim. Well, we know who that is. It's Christendom. 
And Christendom will experience the words of Jeremiah 8.20. And this is bound to be her experience in the very near future. The claim concerning her spirituality is false. And uh, we can see the real condition of Christendom today. Throughout Christendom, there is uh, a shortage of spirituality. There's a spiritual crop failure. There is a dearth of spirituality. She's spiritually dead. And the spirituality which would have proved to be her salvation in the uh, very difficult days that lie ahead for her is absent. And so it is that when Babylon the Great is destroyed, this very lack of spirituality on the part of Christendom will prove her to be a disloyal, hypocritical Christian and deserving therefore of death, and she will die because her harvest has come to an end, her summer has passed, and she has nothing on which to live spiritually, so she shall die, not peacefully, but violently, as a disloyal Christian. Now, uh, it's interesting in viewing this matter from the standpoint of the spiritual harvest with which we are concerned to observe just a few things that Christendom says about herself. We have in a published uh, article relative to the subject why churches are worried, this to quote, disillusioned and bewildered over their role in church and society. Men and women today are leaving the clergy and religious orders by the thousands. Well, that's a statement of what is happening according to this writer. And then, a religious leader himself is quoted. This is the moderator of the New York Presbytery of the United Presbyterian Church. And he summed up uh, his view of the church's mission in these words to quote him. I see the ministry in terms of social action, not in terms of preaching or the rest of the nonsense we went through years ago. In our day, we are more concerned about man than God. God can take care of himself. He can. But their concern is about man. Now, from another standpoint, we have a comparison respecting the publications of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses and other religious publications. And uh, we're concerned with this and we're interested in this. This is uh, in the magazine industry newsletter, a small publication distributed to the publishing trade only. It's written in a breezy and uh, what some persons would call a sophisticated style, not the way we'd write the article, but it gives some interesting points. To quote uh, some excerpts from it, what will five cents buy? The watchtower and awake. Sales zoom. But religious publications in general are praying for better times. The religious press is hurting. Subscriptions have sagged. Revenues from advertising have dipped. Two major magazines may fold. And then an examination is made of the constant increase in the distribution of the watchtower magazine announcing Jehovah's Kingdom, which now is uh, at a circulation of 7,050,000 each issue, and the Awake magazine. Also, he examines uh, foreign language publications of the Watchtower and Awake in his little article, and he says, an underground edition is published in the USSR. The Soviets have tried to topple the Russian language watchtower by planting counterfeit issues loaded with state propaganda on newsstands everywhere. Few takers. The Bible translations are way off. Christ did not walk on borscht. That's uh, beet soup. And then uh, the sales of hardbound books, as he refers to them. The truth that leads to eternal life. The New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. Did man get here by evolution or creation? 
is the Bible really the word of God? And he says printing is what Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York Incorporated is all about. And the society, now having 29 rotary presses in operation, has 23 more on order. So he comes down to a contrasting point. In contrast to Watchtower, War Cry, the weekly Salvation Army newspaper, has a circulation as rigidly defined as the melodic range of a tambourine. A schism within the organization appears to have stunted circulation growth of the publication. Publication of the Sunday School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention are ailing. Circulation has declined. Readers digest with a halo is Catholic digest, but the halo is shrinking. The Lutheran is off. Ad pages on a decline. The Lutheran witness and Lutheran witness reporter circulation has ebbed. Young Catholic messenger circulation has plummeted. The Register, published by the Catholic Press Society in Denver, Colorado, is, exper is experiencing grave circulation problems. The sign is another sign of the times. That's a Catholic magazine. Circulation is down. Our Sunday visitor, rumors persist that our Sunday visitor may fold. Its skidding circulation is referred to. And common wheel, current circulation is off. Christianity and crisis, the Protestant counterpart of common wheel, circulation is slumped. Sales of religious books, excluding Bibles, sagged. Small publishers, or rather recently, both Scribner's and Macmillan, those are two very large publishers, phased out their religious departments. Some small publishers or religious books have gone out of business. So there's a contrast from the standpoint of the distribution of those things which uphold the doctrines of the two religious groups. The New World Society of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses and the uh, Christendom wing of Babylon the Great. So there's a contrast, you see. A contrast is shown in so many ways. We have here a report from Belgium about uh, a woman who, uh, as the uh, writer here, the branch servant states, uh, is a lady who has not yet come to the point of giving up her attendance at mass at the local Catholic church. The study is held in the, quote, blue bombshell, as some call the book, The Truth That Leads to Eternal Life. However, said the lady to the overseer who was also a pioneer, as the sermon at Mass is not always so very interesting, I take my blue book with me and I prepare the study while the priest is giving his sermon. <laughs> we had uh, an assembly in 1969 throughout Europe, as you know, and many of our congregation uh, uh, groups in Africa went to Paris. And in central, the Central African Republic, it was necessary to get the government permission for them to travel. They had to obtain this permission from the Minister of the Interior for the African brothers to travel to the Paris Assembly, and this permission was granted. But one of the ministers who is friendly toward uh, the truth and uh, personally acquainted with many of Jehovah's Witnesses in his, his country told them that this request for travel caused quite a stir in the ministry department of the government. During their discussions, the ministers... Uh, said, some of them, that Jehovah's Witnesses are going to Paris to receive instructions on how to carry on after Armageddon. Of course, you and I know they went to Paris to receive some instructions how to carry on before Armageddon, not just only after Armageddon. Another said that if Jehovah's Witnesses say the end is near, then they must be right because a while back the awake said that a financial crisis was shaping up, and it did come. Still quoting the letter. So if Jehovah's Witnesses speak of the end, it is because they know the end is near. So it was decided to allow the witnesses to go to Paris and that the Central African Embassy in Paris be notified to send some men to the assembly to hear what was going on there. And apparently they were present at the assembly. They'd asked quite a few brothers to give them the date of uh, the beginning of Armageddon. 
When we left Paris, they were at the airport to see us off, and one was quite offended because we told them we did not know the date. He thought we were trying to hide something from them. They wanted the date, end of the quotation. Well, we do too sometimes, but that's not our chief concern in life. We want to be found on Jehovah's side when that date comes, whether that is uh, 20 years and uh, three or four days after the dedication of this Kingdom Hall in 1951 or a longer period of time, a few uh, more moons to pass from now. From another standpoint, from Sweden, the contrast is shown in this quotation from a Swedish religious publication written by a Swedish minister of the Swedish Mission Association. Ringing church bells we can do, but ringing doorbells we do not want to do. But of course the membership of Christian denominations is dwindling year by year. And he talks about the early Christian, simple and cheap, method of winning souls and says every time a witness rings on my door I feel accused and condemned by my own conscience in another way we uh, see a contrast there was a brother in Mexico who wanted to come to the United States to attend a convention not an educated man a humble person and he found out he had to have some travel papers or some identification to get the travel papers, a visa. And when he went to the office to get the travel papers, the visa, he had no identification. The only thing he had was uh, the Mexican equivalent of our kingdom ministry called the informant. And that used to be the name of our uh, present kingdom ministry in this country, too. So he handed the immigration uh, officials as his identification, his copy of his informant or his kingdom ministry. And they looked it over and they looked at each other and they decided to give him the visa and they gave him the visa to travel to the United States and back on the basis of the fact he showed he was one of Jehovah's Witnesses because he had a copy of the kingdom ministry. And there isn't any other uh, preacher of religion traveling about the world identifying himself as one of Jehovah's Witnesses with a copy of the Kingdom Ministry except Jehovah's Witness. From the Huntsville, Alabama Times, the bankrupt condition of Christendom is shown by an editorial published there last year. It's long and I'll read it all. It's headed a shocking letter. The Jehovah's Witnesses have announced a circuit convention to be held at the National Guard Armory here. Permission for the use of the facility has been routinely and properly approved by armory officials. It is disturbing to find in yesterday's letters directed to the Times, this is the Huntsville, Alabama Times newspaper, one taking strong exception to use of the armory by the religious group disturbing primarily because it was signed by the pastors of two Protestant churches, one located in Huntsville and the other in Madison, Alabama. The immediate inclination of the times was to simply dismiss such a letter as not acceptable, as indeed it was not. The reflection suggests, however, that as a conscionable newspaper in an American community, we must feel constrained not to ignore the issue the letter raises. The pastor signing the letter said, quoting, Our objection is not on religious grounds, though we certainly do disagree with their doctrines. Well, that's good. However, we strongly feel that the use of such a building should be denied to such a group on the grounds of disloyalty to country. Will our government permit all American flags to be removed to avoid offending the witnesses? or will they just be allowed to pull them down?" End of quotation. Then the uh, editorial continues. Has the witnesses sect ever shown any desire or intent to pull down the American flag? Have the witnesses ever been listed by the government as subversive? 
Have the witnesses ever expressed any allegiance to violence? Of course not. Well, very well, say the two pastors who signed the letter, but we say the Jehovah's Witnesses should be so listed. The burden of proof must lie upon the pastors, and their charge is so great that it should never be attempted except on the most meticulous evidence. The writers of this letter are gravely misled if they feel that such an attack upon a group of conscientious Americans gains stature when presented upon the letterhead of any church or any other organization, and if they expect they will be allowed recklessly to spread charges of subversion through the columns of this newspaper, they are wrong. That's the end of the editorial, and we say good for the Huntsville, Alabama Times. There's another more pressing area in our lives now in which the religions of Christendom, all of them, Catholic, Protestant, and all the offshoots, demonstrate their absolute spiritual bankruptcy, crop failure, and disloyalty to Jehovah God and his word of truth, the Bible. And that is in connection with the tremendous problem that is upon the young persons of uh, all of Christendom, and of all the world, too. But especially we're concerned with Christendom because we live in that part of the world. The fact is that this problem that uh, confronts young persons today and which extends beyond them and affects older persons as well, which divides families and divides countries to a great extent, which is wrecking the schools and wrecking uh, the relationship between the older and the younger persons that constitute the population of the nations of Christendom. This problem is the primary responsibility of the churches of Christendom and their own words demonstrate that this is the case. We need to refer to their own words. I don't want anybody to say that I or anyone of Jehovah's Witnesses manufactured something out of whole cloth. But here in an article, Religion in the Age of Aquarius, in the Age of Astrology, which is our age, this is stated, and it's correct in, uh, as far as it goes. The war in Vietnam, the failure of the civil rights movement, and it has failed, and other recent events have led young persons to a serious questioning of the authority of science, reason, and technology. Now, we understand that. It's saying that many young persons question the authority of reason, human reasoning, been done by what is often referred to by those of the establishment. That's just an expression that has come up in recent years. We know what it means. It means the order of things as it has continued, undisturbed as far as objection on the part of young persons uh, is concerned. So they're questioning the authority of science and reason, human reason and technology, human technology including all the commercial technology, all of technology and military technology. The very values with which religion had attempted to reach an accommodation. And what this man is saying and presenting his points in this manner is that religion has proved itself disloyal to God. And instead of adhering to the Word of God and following that and finding out what's in the Word of God and sticking to that, they have sought an accommodation with reason, with human reason, with science, and with technology. And religion has done that, and for that reason, young people call in question the authority of these uh, elements in human uh, leadership of science and reason and technology. And since religion has made an accommodation with these elements of the earth, 
The young people cannot turn to the orthodox religions of Christendom for help, for guidance and direction, for support, for encouragement, for strength. Their reaction has led, among other things, to a new interest in Eastern religion, astrology, witchcraft, drugs, spiritualism, and other phenomena that were presumably incompatible with modern scientific knowledge. These things are also incompatible with the Word of God. But the churches of Christendom make no effort to teach the young persons the Word of God. The young people who are taking these extreme steps to show their disenchantment with the establishment, as they call it, know nothing about the Word of God because neither their parents nor themselves have been taught the Word of God by the religions of Christendom, because the religions of Christendom, Catholic and Protestant, are disloyal to the Word of God. They're hypocrite Christians. They have a spiritual crop failure. And that's the reason they're going to die of spiritual starvation when destruction comes upon Babylon the Great. Now, we know that. And we can see from this standpoint that this problem that confronts every young person upon the earth is properly laid at the door of false religions of Christendom. <laughs> it's resulted in a circumstance like this, the American family being the head of the article. In the 1960s, the American family was threatened tested, torn asunder, and turned upside down. The land of the free and the worship of youth became a dictatorship of the young. In this writer's view, that's the situation. But many of you are young people, young men and young women. You're our young brothers, our young sisters. You're young ministers of Jehovah's Witnesses. You're Jehovah's Christian Witnesses yourselves. You're not dictators, but you're in school, some of you, and you have uh, contact with young persons in other capacities, and many of you help your young companions, or try to. You don't like to see them go far out and do things that you know are contrary to the Word of God. You know the results that this will lead to, and there are some things you can do to help your young companions. They have the great problem. You're aware of the great problem, but you have the discipline and protection of the Word of God and your Christian families and the congregations, but these other young people don't have that. And you want to help them many times you try to. And there are some things you can call to their attention. One is, as we've already mentioned, that the fact that the uh, religions of Christendom have sought an accommodation with all the evil forces of the old world does not mean the Bible is wrong. <clears throat> you can also help them on the basis of the danger that they face if they pursue the extreme course that uh, a good many of the young persons are taking under wrong leadership. If you want some statistics, you can refer to crime statistics in your discussion of the matter with young persons. You use them to warn uh, these others, these companions of yours with whom you perhaps you're trying to start a Bible study or uh, otherwise interest in the truth of the Bible. The recent published crime statistics show that uh, the national rate of criminal homicide per 100,000 has increased 36 percent, forcible rape 65 percent, aggravated assault 67 percent, robbery 119 percent and so forth. And maybe in your discussion of it, your young friend will say, well, that's because more crime is reported now than it used to be. So there isn't really an increase of crime. An increase is in the reporting. And sometimes people try to tell you that. But that's not true. And you may be helped in your discussion of the matter by this. The FBI recognizes these statistics must be used with caution. There's a large gap between reported rapes and the true rates. Reported rates and the true rates. In 1967, the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and, Admi and Administration of Justice stated that the true rate of total major violent crime was roughly twice as high as the reported rate. Now, if that's correct, then instead of being 36 percent, 
Criminal homicide is up 72%. Forcible rape, 130%. Aggravated assault, six, uh, 134%. Robbery, 238%. So you can talk to your young friends about this. Of course, we can take warning ourselves. Now, you can involve y the uh, young companions of yours by pointing out the fact that violent crime is concentrated especially among youths between 15 and 24 years of age. Statistics show that. In the city where I live in New York, uh, very few crimes are reported. The fewer still are processed. And the uh, prisons of New York City are so crowded so crowded that a person who is innocent is held and the person who is guilty is freed. Why? Because the guilty person is held a while, a deal is made by his lawyer with the district attorney, the prosecuting attorney, so that for a guilty plea, a light sentence can be given and he's freed soon, if not uh, having already stayed in prison several months so that he can be freed. And the result is that those cases never come to trial. The courts are so clogged, those cases cannot be heard. There's no time to hear them. There are no jails to hold everybody that would have to be held for trial if they all pleaded not guilty. So the person who's guilty can plead guilty and walk out of jail the person who insists, I'm innocent, I didn't do the crime, he's held for trial indefinitely. And the courts are breaking down. They cannot handle them. The New York jails are overcrowded. They're stuffed mostly with young persons. And you can help your young companions on this point and show them that if they adopt a course of action or a mental attitude in which they totally dis disregard the Word of God, the chances are that they will wind up in one of these categories of crime. The chances are they will ri uh, wind up, they will end up, or the results to them will be that they'll engage in aggravated assault, to become rapists, to become thieves, users of dope and otherwise degenerates uh, in human society. You can help them, you see, to see this danger. And the danger exists for any very young man and young woman who would say, I just don't go along with the Word of God. We're impressed, too, if we realize what a disadvantage uh, these young persons are in the hands of adults, bad leaders who are generally adults. For instance, they are told something like the following, which is a quotation from one of their publications. Laugh at professors, disobey your parents, burn your money. You know life is a dream. All of your institutions are man-made delusions. What is needed is a generation of people who are freaky, crazy, irrational, sexy, angry, irreligious, childish, and mad. People who burn high school and college degrees, people who say, to hell with your goals. It goes on like that. Now to you, you, you that doesn't sound good. You say, well, I, I know that's not in harmony with the Word of God. So you can warn them. Then you can also tell your young companions, if you wish to help them and have an opportunity, that advantages being taken care of them by commercialism. This uh, is an illustration of the fact, selling the youth market. This is a program of a seminar to uh, educate businessmen of various uh, occupations or industries in selling the youth market, selling things to young persons. Quoting, almost one out of every two persons in the United States is under the age of 25. During the 1970s, this youth market will control 
over 45 billion in spending power annually, and it is growing at a phenomenal rate. I knew youngsters had lots of money, but this says they have a spending power of $45 billion. Every company that has a product or service to sell must be alert and conditioned to the changing times and character of the market. Today's youth and the youth of the 70s are and will be better educated, more informed, will have almost five times as much money to spend and are more physically conditioned to outdoor fast-paced living than the youth of 15 to 20 years ago. The company that sees the impact of this youth market and develops products, plans, strategies, and tactics to take advantage and earn brand loyalty now is the company that will continue to grow and prosper in this lucrative market. However, before a company becomes obsessed with this attractive market, patterns must be monitored. Fads must be pursued cautiously. Youth buying behavior must be analyzed. Special communication techniques must be studied and long-range strategies must be developed that will integrate current products and plans with special youth marketing endeavors. Now, this is the program to accomplish this uh, objective. It includes the subjects, importance of the youth market, the buying power of youth, the growing impact of youth influence, behavior of youth as a consuming group, fundamental processes of youth buyer behavior, special youth marketing, temporary fads, understanding youth communication, what tactics to avoid, and other similar articles uh, or uh, items on their educational program. So you can help uh, your young companions see that uh, in all these uh, fads, which they adopt uh, for various reasons, uh, they're being sold a bill of goods, to use that expression. Advantages being taken care of, uh, of them. And uh, adults, the establishment operating uh, the manufacturing and uh, marketing industries of the United States, as well as the other parts of the world, are willing to sell the youngsters anything that they b will buy to get their share of that $45 billion that the youth of the United States have in spending power every year. Now, these statistics of $45 billion, they have been disputed. Some economists will say that their uh, buying power is not that great, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that uh, just as the adults are having advantage t taken of them by the advertising and marketing industries of this country, so the youth are. And they'll make uh, adults or children or youth uh, look uh, as ridiculous as, as uh, anybody wants to look if it means some money in their pocket. They don't care what they sell people to wear, to smoke, to eat, to drink, to read. They don't care what filth they peddle in any form as long as it makes the money. And it's because of the economic advantage that uh, degenerate ideas and degenerate living bring to the men who promote such, that such continues. It's strictly dollars, strictly dollars. And maybe, and you talk about this to your young companion, you can help them see, well, maybe I better find out what's in the Bible after all. I want protection from all these things. But in doing so, you will need to help your young companion reach a point where he or she is willing to be governed by the Word of God and help this young person that you're trying to assist, hopefully in your heart and mind, to become actually one of Jehovah's Witnesses too. Help this young person to see that unless they are willing to be governed by the Word of God, the things that are plainly written in the Word of God, they cannot be loyal to God. But they'll be like Christendom. They'll be disloyal. And if in your study of the Bible with some young person you point out something in the Bible or in the 
truth book or in the watchtower, all based on the Word of God, all setting forth a scriptural principle. And this person says, well, I don't go along with that. You mark that in your mind because you know a person that says, I do not go along with what's in the watchtower. I do not go along with what's in the Bible. Such a person as that is not sufficiently mature to warrant your association or especially to warrant your trust. You wouldn't trust that person at all, not with your life. But you see, you may be able to help that person become a loyal supporter of the Word of God. And uh, one help you'll receive, you'll have in doing that is your own loyalty to the Word of God. And reaching the point in your own mind and heart, I won't do a thing that is uh, advised against by the Watchtower because I know my loyalty to Jehovah God and Christ Jesus and the Bible of necessity includes my loyalty to the only organization on the face of this earth that Jehovah God is using to discipline me and help me in the affairs of life so that I can become and continue a royal minister of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses, you see. Otherwise, we might as well go along with the Catholics or the Methodists or the Jews or the Hindus or all the other endless varieties of religions that claim to be Christian but will not allow themselves to be disciplined by the Word of God. So what a wonderful position you're in to help your young companions in these matters. And we have a lot to encourage us if we're young. We have a lot to encourage us if we're older, too, in this matter. And one of these is the fine result that is so often it obtained by young persons helping other young persons. I have here <coughs> quite a long letter from a young woman, and it's, it is long, but it's interesting, and it's appropriate to our discussion. Our discussion, which is of the fact that harvest time is here. Harvest time may bring a harvest, but harvest time may bring a crop failure. To prison it's brought a crop failure. This is a letter. I danced and sang with a group of hard rock musicians. Now, uh, I think most everybody knows what that means. It's in hard rock used to mean rocks that were hard, but now it means something <laughs> else and traveled the East Coast. We entertained in nightclubs and teen clubs. Nearly two years I followed this way of life. Last winter a musician friend, while we had conversation at our regular get-together nightclub, gave me the truth that leads to eternal life and said he thought I would like it because our conversations were usually about God. And that's true. These young folks, they talk so much about religion. And that's why so many get interested in astrology and mysticism, yoga, Eastern religions, spiritism, all condemned by the Bible. That uh, very night I read it in bed in three hours. When I first opened the book, the picture of the child and the lion thrilled me. When I finished the book, I gave thanks to Jehovah for letting me find the truth. I was crying. I was so happy. This is a young woman. Right then I set my heart to doing Jehovah's will. I got out of bed and gathered up my astrology book and calendar and put them in the garbage. When I went to the nightclubs, I talked to people about the truth, both the musicians and the customers. As I had never had a Bible study, I didn't have the scriptures to back me up. I moved from Charleston to California and there came in contact with brother so-and-so, formerly of Charleston, and a musician of the group known as the Villagers. He had become one of Jehovah's Witnesses while in California, but he had sent a friend, also formerly from Charleston, to return to Charleston from California to get a group of us to come to California. And most of those friends had in mind that they were going to play music, but instead he surprised them with a Bible study. We had eight people studying the truth. Out of the eight of us, three are now baptized, and the others are still studying. One was baptized three months after one of the musicians. July 17th this year, his wife and I were baptized. March the 1st, I started the study. Sometimes I had three studies a week. I studied things in which it is impossible for God to lie. 
life everlasting in the freedom of the sons of God, the truth that leads to eternal life, and also the lamp book questions. I read Awake, Watchtower, and everything I could get. I got part-time work two days a week so I could, could do door-to-door -door work and study. Since I had officially started my study, I missed only one meeting. When our group went to the Kingdom Hall in California, all of us had long hair, and men had beards. We were very warmly received at the Kingdom Hall. And this was a surprise and encouragement. And that's the way you receive persons at this Kingdom Hall, too. When our group went to the Kingdom Hall, I read that. I had been a user of LSD and marijuana and other drugs such as speed, hashish, and these drugs subject, subjected me to some tormenting and horrifying experiences. I prayed to Jehovah to restore my mental powers and senses and bring me back to reality, and he answered my prayers. When I called on Jehovah for help, I gave up the use of drugs and have never returned to them since, and I never will. Jehovah never let me down, and through his guidance I know that his way is always the right way. As the scripture states, the truth will set you free. It surely set me free from many anxieties and from the broad road that leads to destruction. And she signs her name as a sister. She's one of Jehovah's Witnesses. What a nice report that is from somebody who's gone through the experience. What a blessing it was for the other young persons who helped this entire group of musicians uh, in the study of the truth and apparently all continuing and several of them now are Jehovah's Witnesses, our brothers and sisters. You see, in becoming dedicated servants of God, they have willingly and understandingly brought themselves under the discipline of the Bible. So when a person makes a dedication and symbolizes it, all the rest of us know what to expect from that person. And we know that that person uh, can be depended upon to conform to the Word of God. And when he finds a conflict between his own wishes or own desires or course of action or ideas and the Bible, he'll uh, willingly conform to the Bible. It's the only way we can be loyal to God. If we don't do that, we're disloyal to God. We're not worthy of life. <laughs> We've had a, an individual, uh, <clears throat> uh, small scale, but nevertheless important, spiritual crop failure to that extent. And we're not like Christendom at all. There's another area in which Christendom has uh, shown its spiritual bankruptcy. And uh, again, they're not accepting the uh, King Christ Jesus and his rule in doing so. Now, when we consider the problem that uh, it has brought upon the young persons of Christendom, we can see this is so. We think, for instance, of Ecclesiastes 10.16, which uh, states, in considering the rule of youth, the dictatorship of youth, to use the language of that little newspaper item, uh, stating, uh, uh, how uh, will it be with you, O land, when uh, your king is a boy and your princes keep eating even until the morning? And therefore, eating uh, uh, for the gratification of their senses, uh, drunkenness, and other gratification of senses. Now, we know that's what uh, the question involves, because the next sentence in that scripture says, not answering the question, but in contrast, after saying, how will it be with you, O land, when your uh, king is a boy, and your princes keep eating even until the morning? Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of noble ones and your princes eat for mightiness and not for mere drinking. Well, uh, our king is not a boy. The theocratic congregation of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses is not run by a boy or a bunch of boys. The boys uh, don't have the experience. The uh, commercial organizations of the world, corporate and otherwise, many of them are run by boys now. Many of them have disregarded the conservative uh, policies that have marked these companies over the years, whereby they have become known as guild edge companies and have abandoned those conservative policies. And these youngsters have 
taken on unconservative policies and have overextended all the corporations, practically without any exception, during the past 10 years. So that without uh, any exception or with very few exceptions, practically all of the corporate organizations in industry now are in financial trouble. And uh, that's true. And it's the result of being ruled by boys who have abandoned conservative business principles and have overextended uh, their corporate uh, activities and therefore have betrayed their corporate trusts. But that's another matter. What uh, we're concerned with is the fact that our king is not a boy. Our king is the son of the most noble one of all the universe, Jehovah God himself. He is our uh, God and our King is His Son, Christ Jesus, you see. And it makes no difference our age, young or old, we're all under the rulership uh, of this one. But not the religions of Christendom. No, sir. In fact, uh, in this other area that is such a problem of life, in the area of the pollution and the destruction of man's home or man's environment, the religions of Christendom say that the blame is to be placed not upon man's misuse of his home, but upon the word of Jehovah God. We have to quote their own words to even believe such a thing. In this article, Our Bible Believers Spoilers, the professor of applied Christianity at Union Theological Seminary in New York City said that Bible believers are spoilers. The Bible, quoting him, in its radical monotheism, that is, its radical teaching of one supreme God desacralizes or makes unsacred nature. And he therefore criticizes the Christian teaching uh, of abandonment of pagan worship of the elements of nature. In uh, an article, The Link Between Faith and Ecology, over the centuries, the growth of Western science and technology has been closely tied to Christian religious values. The fundamental teaching of Genesis has given ultimate significance to the scientific method. Some of these fundamental religious assumptions are being questioned. Christian thought has entertained ideas that a Yale theologian expressed last week, quoting him, legitimized or made legitimate man's total exploitation of his environment. And along the same vein, Christianity linked to pollution, a group of Protestant theologians asserted here today that Christianity had played its part in provoking the current environmental crisis. Virtually all of the Protestant scholars agreed that the traditional Christian attitude toward nature had given sanction to exploitation of the environment and contributed to ecological threats. Basic to this assertion is the commandment in Genesis 1.28 for man to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And it goes on in the same vein. Christian rejection of pagan beliefs in the divinity of nature made it possible for Western society to exploit nature indifferent to its mood. And uh, the dean of the Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. goes to fa uh, so far as to say that the central symbols of Holy Communion, bread and wine, were fundamental symbols of the earth and life. And our master who established the memorial of his death and commanded that his followers observe it, said concerning the bread, this means my body, concerning the wine, this means my blood. And these religious leaders are saying the word of God is to blame. They don't believe the Bible. They don't teach the Bible. But they're willing to blame the Bible. But we're Jehovah's Witnesses. And we cannot let that uh, accusation go unchallenged. And we're glad to have the opportunity to point out to the people that uh, the book of Genesis is not commanding man to despoil his home. And if it will be read, even a 
Protestant clergyman can see that it says that man was placed upon the earth to cultivate it, to dress it, to keep it. And if he has an understanding of Jehovah's purpose, he'll know that it was God's purpose for the borders or boundaries of paradise to be pushed to include all the earth, an earth-wide paradisaic home for man, and further that Jehovah's purpose in this respect is going to be realized. Now oh, they're spiritually bankrupt. If anybody thinks we're taking advantage of this occasion to criticize the churches of Christendom, he's right. <laughs> but not just the Protestants, because we have here a quotation from one of the leading liberal theologians of the Roman Catholic Church, which organization is so obviously uh, on the descendants, quoting him, is a church credible when it preaches peace, justice, freedom, and democracy to the world, but finds itself incapable of realizing these ideals within its own walls. Here we see something apparently still quite possible in the Catholic Church, namely an absolutistic misuse of spiritual authority, an insult to all democracy in the Church, biblically understood, and a glaring contradiction to the spirit and intention of the Second Vatican Council. It has now become clear to world opinion what lies behind the secret proceedings and privy chamber politics involved in naming bishops. In Holland, as everywhere, it is the primary instrument of a Roman imperialism which contradicts the most basic demands of the Christian gospel and the service which should characterize the Petrine or Peter office. What is required? a new participation by clergy and laity, following the example of the early church. The original constitution of the church, which was by no means absolutistic, must become practice once again. Papal absolutism has the New Testament against it, an authority which in the long run it will not be able to withstand. And the hierarchy is absolutely unable to cope with this attitude that extends throughout its organization. And it, but the poor people are left without a doctrine to which to cling and without an organization in which to take refuge because the doctrines are discarded one after the other and the organization is riddled innumerable ways from within and now is attempting to create a new image for itself in South America as a uh, in regards to uh, human rights instead of a religious uh, organization. Social endeavors, divesting itself of vast blocks of its corporate stocks to get funds to endeavor to create this new world image for the Roman Catholic Church, even abandoning its own doctrines, let alone abandoning the word of God. Situation to exist at the time of the kingdom the kingdom was established in the year 1914, about October 4th to 5th of that month. And uh, the prophecy of Amos tells us what should be the situation. Uh, agriculturally and figuratively speaking, when the kingdom is established. It's in Amos chapter 9, verse 11. Jehovah God says, in that day I shall raise up the booth of David that is fallen, and I shall certainly repair their breaches, and its ruins I shall raise up, and I shall certainly build it up as in the days of long ago. Well, now what should follow that building up the booth of David? The disciple James shows what should follow. Back in the year of, uh, year 33 of our common era, the tabernacle of David appeared to be in a very dilapidated state with the Messiah, lying dead outside the walls of Jerusalem. And then uh, shortly thereafter, Jehovah God raised him from the dead, and thereafter he ascended on high, and subsequent to that, the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And after that occur occasion, 
the uh, word of God uh, spread and the Christian congregation multiplied. And then uh, this was uh, uh, dating from Pentecost, which was the day that the uh, first fruits of the wheat harvest were being offered at the temple there in Jerusalem. Eventually, not only was a remnant of the Jews gathered into the Christian congregation, but the door was open for the Gentiles. And when they responded, a question came up as to whether or not they must be circumcised. As a result of this question, the uh, gathering was held in Jerusalem for a determination of the question. And then it was that James got up here in 49 of our common era and made a statement found in the 15th chapter of Acts, verses 13 to 18. He says, Brothers, hear me. Simeon, that's Peter, has related thoroughly how God for the first time turned his attention to the nations to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree. And here he makes reference, you see, to the prophet Amos. After these things, I shall return to build the royal palace of David that has fallen down, and I shall rebuild its ruins and erect it again, in order that those who remain of the men may earnestly seek Jehovah, together with people of all the nations, people who are called by my name, says Jehovah, who is doing these things, which he has known from of old. Well, that's the way James uh, quoted the prophecy in making application of it. And it's true, it's there in Amos, because verses... Uh, 11 and 12 say, I shall certainly build it up as in the days of long ago to the end that they may take possession of what is left remaining of Edom and all the nations upon whom my name is called and so forth. And then uh, the prophet goes on in verse 13. Look, there are days coming is the utterance of Jehovah and the plowman will actually overtake the harvester. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean trouble? Trouble because uh, the kingdom has been established. The booth or tabernacle uh, of David uh, built up with the Christ Jesus the King upon the throne. And is this uh, uh, plow with its plowshare uh, the... Uh, Plowshare of Armageddon cutting through the soil and overturning things in the great time of trouble? What no, could not be that? No. This is not a prophecy of trouble. Maybe in 1908 uh, the congregation here thought it might be, and maybe in 1951 we thought, well, maybe that's a reference to the trouble of Armageddon. But we see and look at the prophecy, that would not be the case. This is not the plowshare making cuts and crevices to overturn the soil. It's not a destruction of the prophecy that is coming at Armageddon, but it's a prophecy of God's blessing upon his loyal people. Now, we know that because the prophet goes on to say, the plowman will actually overtake the harvester and the treader of grapes, the carrier of the seed. So here we have a parallel expression. The plowman, he plows up the soil, and then along comes the one carrying the seed in order to plant it and lay the basis for a successful crop. So this is a promise of blessing and of great fruitfulness for God's people. And to this end, the prophecy goes on to say what will be the effect, not only of the planting, but the tending of the ground and the caring for the vineyards and for the fields, because he says and the mountains will actually drip with sweet wine, and the very hills will all find themselves melting, melting with the grape juice, as it were, inundated with wine from the treading of this tremendous uh, crop of grapes from the uh, uh, vintage of that harvest. And I shall certainly gather the captive ones of my people Israel, They'll build the desolated cities and inhabit them and plant vineyards and drink the wine of them and make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And they'll dwell in security. Now, this corresponds with the prophecy of Leviticus 26.3 where Jehovah says, if you continue walking in my statutes and keeping my commandments and you do carry them out, 
I'll prosper you. I'll give you your showers of rain at the proper time. The land will give its yield. Your threshing will reach to your grape gathering. Your grape gathering will reach to the sowing of the seed. See, a, an overlapping because of the great abundance. Now, this uh, prophetic promise that the threshing time will reach to the treading of the grapes and the gathering of the grapes will come up close to the sowing of the seed shows that there is to be a great bountifulness of this earth in offering its yield of good things because of the obedience of Jehovah God's people, both in a literal agricultural way and in a symbolic spiritual agricultural or harvest way. And this has been the experience of God's people, not uh, only since the year 1951, but even going back as far as 1919. Up until the spring of that year, the condition of God's kingdom, as uh, represented by his anointed one upon the earth, did look very, very bleak. And the work was uh, greatly slowed down in many areas, brought to a halt. The Jehovah's people were faithful to him. They had their difficulties. Jehovah rescued them from these difficulties. There came the reversal of the situation. Jehovah's people came out of Babylon, returned to him with repentance, and they got busy in the Lord's work. So when God says here in this prophecy that the mountains are going to drip with uh, grape juice or sweet wine and the hills be inundated, as it were, uh, this is not going to be an automatic thing, but it is the result of the work on the part of God's people. So he preserved us for that. And uh, this occasion today is an evidence that there has been a response on the part of God's people. They've been loyal to him and he's blessed them and given them great spiritual pros prosperity. So there's a lot of work connected with that. Plowing, planting, clearing of the weeds, keeping of the ground in condition, and these other things that must be done agriculturally. And Jehovah got back, uh, Jehovah's people did get back to work. And this especially during the past 20 years. 20 years ago, we were active in 29 countries on the continent of Africa. And all these statistics that are, are uh, of interest to us are in our report in the 1970 yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses. If you don't have a copy, I recommend it to you for your information. It's really thrilling. There were 51 countries reached on that continent 20 years later. And there we had more than 250,000 publishers. But think of the spiritual prosperity recognized uh, among Jehovah's people on that continent. You know, of course, of the banning of uh, our work in the Cameroon and in Gabon. Well, we have a letter here from the Congo Brazzaville Republic. And uh, it's long, but it's of interest, and I'll read a good bit of it. As a result of banning our organization in Cameroon, members of the government here held a meeting to discuss what should be done with Jehovah's Witnesses in Congo, Brazzaville. It appears that they concluded that Jehovah's Witnesses were to have freedom of religion here. And here's uh, a recounting, very briefly, of the... Uh, highlights of the events that led up to this conclusion, which still stands, and we hope it continues to stand. When the president to uh, toured the northern part of the country, the politicians there suggested that he ban our work, and he said no. Jehovah's Witnesses are busy with their mission of preaching the kingdom of God. You wish to teach socialism. In time, we'll see who will succeed. If they're right, they'll convert you. If you... Uh, what you have is better, you can prove it to them and win them over to socialism. So time will tell. Well, recently, the government commissar in Pointe Noire, the northern uh, city in Congo, Brazzaville, together with his associates, prepared uh, a proclamation banning uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and had it ready for the president to sign and to announce at his impending visit and uh, uh, speech that he was going to deliver there in Pointe Noire. 
But he didn't sign it. In fact, uh, they launched into a three-day discussion of the matter. And uh, these three days were part of the same uh, dates that were occupied by our Peace on Earth, uh, or rather Men of Goodwill District Assembly held in Bratzaville, August 20 to 23. Now, the events that took place at this meeting are as follows. They're highlighted here. The commissar said, we've prepared a decree outlawing Jehovah's Witnesses, which you can sign and announce to the public in your talk this afternoon. The president said, but don't you know that we have freedom of religion in our country? And all religions, even Jehovah's Witnesses, are entitled to it. Commissar, both the Cameroon and Gabonese governments have banned the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. Do you know why they banned them? No, but they refuse to participate in the parades at our political rallies. When we hold our parades, does uh, everyone in the city share in them, leaving no one at all at home? Is it not uh, voluntary to uh, participate in these parades? Well, they also refuse to give or take blood. Does every Christian, or rather, does every citizen in the country give blood? Jehovah's Witnesses have their religion, and they try to live up to it. Besides, is there any way in which they hinder our revolutionary government? How many Jehovah's Witnesses are there in prison here? Not one. How many witnesses have ever been in a coup d'etat? Not one. We have no real reason to ban their organization. We do not have to fear Jehovah's Witnesses. But you Catholics and Protestants, we have to watch. You Catholics are always in the coup d'etat. Many Catholics and Protestants are in prison. Jehovah's Witnesses are good citizens. If all citizens in Point Noir were Jehovah's Witnesses, I could walk alone from here to the outskirts of the city without a bodyguard or without having anything to fear. But I cannot do that because of you Catholics. You are the people we must always watch I have no reason to comply with your request, therefore I refuse to do so. So we hope the president maintains that position and our work continues. And from Congo, Kinshasa, the work is continuing. And the recent tour through Africa, taken by a few hundred of American, uh, our American brothers and sisters, have resulted in reports of fine progress there. On the Asian continent, 20 years ago, we were in 15 countries with 1,485 publishers. In Asia now, we're reaching 28 countries. We have over 30,000 publishers. And even in such countries as India, the work is making some progress. Japan reports peak after peak. From the Andaman and Nicobar groups of islands off the coast of India, we have reports of increases in the congregation at Port Blair comprise 50% of former Hindus. The present overseer is a special pioneer who was a former Hindu. And knowing the Hindu mythologies, he's having good success working among those of his former religious faith. Korea, their peak has been reported in the yearbook. And so it is throughout the uh, countries in which we are active on the Asiatic continent. We don't know what's going on in communist China. We have no contact there. Even from such places as Laos and Vietnam, Laos had an all-time peak, 21% increase. Vietnam reached a peak of 52 publishers. And at the beginning of the year, there were three French sisters in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Been in the news a lot. And they there helped one local Chinese woman to begin sharing in preaching the kingdom message. And from another side of Asia, from Lebanon, our report is concerning the unity of the uh, Arabic people, that is the Lebanese people, and uh, the Jewish people in the same congregations throughout Lebanon and throughout Israel and those who are in Jordan. On the continent of Europe, 
We were in, we had uh, 142,000 ministers 20 years ago when this hall was dedicated. We have over 442,000 there 20 years later. And uh, all the reports from Europe, without any exception, speak of the disintegration of the state churches of the nations of Europe and the increase of the New World Society of Jehovah's Witnesses. Same in respect to the islands of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean and the Caribbean Sea. Some of you may remember Brother Eugene Shalkowski, once at Bethel, and now he's, uh, after some years of service in the field in various capacities, the branch servant in Jamaica. And uh, maybe you, some of you heard him give an experience in Pittsburgh at the annual meeting. He said that he was working from house to house and encountered a home of uh, persons of the Rastafarian group, a very radical group that have great uh, hatred for white people and bitter hatred for Jehovah's Witnesses. And they're avoided by our publishers in Jamaica. They don't, the brothers don't subject themselves to these people. They are wise in being cautious. And uh, Brother Tchaikovsky knocked on the gate, which is the way you approach a home, and uh, he saw that the person looking around the corner was a Rastafarian, identified him by his headdress, and said to himself, I'll give him a handbill and go on. But the man came to the gate and he said, come on in. He said, I have, there's some people inside the house that want to talk to you. And uh, in telling the story, Brother Shalkowski says that uh, he prayed to Jehovah as he went down the walk. He didn't know what was going to happen. But inside, among other things, they, he did find some people. And among other things, they said, uh, your father uh, uh, made slaves of our father." He said, my father didn't make slaves of your father because my father's from Poland. They didn't know what Poland was, so he explained that to them. Apparently got along all right, and they said, uh, your father has, a, uh, your God has a white skin, but our God has a black skin. And he helped them by pointing out to them, maybe your God has a black skin, but my God does not have any skin. <laughs> he left and uh, lived to tell the story. Well, uh, Edith and I were in Jamaica recently, had some meetings there, invited us down, and uh, they told us that since that experience, uh, there has been some uh, progress made with just a few of the Rastafarians. And one of these shaggy-haired fellows came to one of the meetings at one of the kingdom halls. He brought a pair of scissors with him, and after the meeting, he had one of the brothers there give him a haircut. That's real progress among <laughs> the Rastafarians. <laughs> like other people who want to stand out from the crowd by their manner of uh, appearance, the Rastafarians also go in for long hair. We can mention many items of this nature to show the progress of the work throughout the Pacific Islands, throughout South America, throughout all the world. But in 1951, in the United States, we had 118,462 average publishers. And uh, throughout the world, we had 384,694 average publishers. And now you know we have over a million 400,000 publishers throughout the world. So don't think that this is the only part of the field where the work has been progressing since your dedication of this Kingdom Hall 20 years ago. We had 3,000 congregations in the United States then. We have 13,470 congregations in the United States at the present time. Well, just notice what has occurred in Rosetta since March of 1951, 20 years ago, there were 90 persons in the congregation, and since that time, 21 of these have uh, moved away, relocating themselves. Now there are 173 active publishers in the congregation, active ministers here. 
During the past 20 years, right here, there have been 229 persons who have been uh, brought uh, to the organization of the New World Society of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses represented by this congregation. Of these, 11 have died over the years. 24 of these persons did not reach the point of dedication. They slipped away. Maybe they'll be given an opportunity as time goes by, but they're not with the congregation now. Of these uh, 229, three of those who did make a dedication, the rest having made a dedication, three of those have uh, become inactive as far as the ministry is concerned. Maybe they'll get to see their wonderful privileges and opportunities and become active again. Many have done that uh, in various places over the past few years. We hope they do and we'd like to help them if possible. Four have been disfellowshipped for disloyalty to God, expressed in various ways. And uh, 71 persons are uh, now a part of congregations nearby. 20 years ago, this congregation had a large area. Now there's some other uh, congregations organized within that area and other nearby congregations in which 71 of these persons are associated and here in Rosetto, included in this uh, 173 publishers in the congregation now, there are 113 remaining of this 229. So that accounts for all 229. What a wonderful uh, 20 years activity. And uh, not only uh, as these statistics show, but uh, they are representative of the uh, uh, stability of Jehovah's worship here. And uh, the holding high of his word and his name loyally by our dear brothers in the congregation here in Rosetta. We have over 5,000 persons who have gone through the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead since its inauguration. I have here an interesting letter along the lines of what we've been discussing which shows the uh, health of the theocratic organization in Quebec. This is uh, in respect to a town called Nicolette and has a sort of a, a holy uh, and saintly location there in uh, Canada, in Quebec. It's uh, on the edge of Lake St. Pierre. It's across it's on the south side of the St. Lawrence River. And uh, right across the river from Nicolette is uh, St. Louis de France, St. Maurice, St. Narcissi, St. Timothy, St. Severin, St. Stanislaus, St. Barnabas, St. Leon, St. Anne de la Prade, and St. Ursula and St. Elizabeth. And then it's right near towns that are named St. Gregory, St. Celestin, St. Monique, St. Francois de Lac, St. Robert, St. Victoire, St. Gertrude, Saint Angel de Laval, and there are other saints around there too, too numerous to mention. <laughs> and this town is the headquarters of the bishop of that area, and they, it has controlled everything in that uh, section of the province. And now we have our publishers in there. Twelve years ago, they couldn't get in there; they weren't allowed in in the city. And now they've closed down the biggest seminary in town for lack of student priests. They sold it to the Quebec government. The government has turned it into a police training school. And from a nearby seminary, they've taken a statue, cut out the golden heart of Mary, and that's offered for sale to, for, to tourists. So if you want to, you can go there and buy a golden heart as, if it hasn't already been sold, or you can buy the entire statue. And the... Uh, priest at a nearby church told his parishioners just a few weeks ago that soon they will have to travel to the next town for mass because he's on the point of closing down his church, closing down his church. And uh, the parochial schools are in the same position there as they are here. Another monastery just north of Montreal has been turned into a hotel for tourists 
And Jehovah's Witnesses this past year have seen a 15% increase for the province of Quebec during this past service year. And those are contracts. Those things mean something to us or should. Well, we're very grateful to Jehovah for his blessings upon his work. We have been kept busy by Jehovah, productive. There's been a great productivity on the part of Jehovah's people. He's visited, visited us with great blessings. This was promised in Ezekiel chapter 34. And here in verses 24 and 27, 26 and 27, he says, I will make them and the surroundings of my hill a blessing and I will cause the pouring rain to descend in its time. Pouring rains of blessings there will prove to be. And the tree of the field must give its fruitage, and the land itself will give its yield. And they will actually prove to be on their soil in security. And they will have to know that I am Jehovah. When I break the bars of their yoke, and I actually deliver them out of the hand of those who have been using them as slaves. Now, this is not as the King James Version states, uh, showers uh, of blessings, but it's as the New World Translation says, pouring rains of uh, blessings there will prove to be, and that's what Jehovah God has done for his people. He's just flooded our lives with his blessings during these past 20 years. And uh, ever since their release in 1919, Jehovah's people have gone forth with the kingdom message, bearing it to others. There's been no stoppage of their work, even during World War II. And uh, when the war ended, they were ready for the post-war period. But Christendom stood there at the end of World War II, also with uh, her missionaries uh, in all parts of the earth. And what about Jehovah's Witnesses who had 50 branches at that time, at the end of World War II? Well, Jehovah God had prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 11 and 12. Jehovah will also make you overflow indeed with prosperity. Jehovah will open up to you his good storehouse, the heavens, to give you rain on your land in its season and to bless every deed of your hand. And you will certainly lend to many nations while you yourselves will not borrow. And that's exactly what Jehovah God has done. He's uh, lent to the nations. He has lent missionaries by the thousands to the nations all around the earth. And these missionaries have gone to territories and have opened them up made the work grow under the blessing of Jehovah God, and we have new branches established in these lands, so we've gone to those lands with the message of the kingdom. And in many cases, the society cannot draw money from those branches, cannot receive the contributions that people make to help print the society's publications which they study. So there's nothing financial in return, and we're literally lending and literally giving to those lands, and uh, this is because of the support of the work by the brothers in the United States primarily. Well, not only have we sent missionaries, but we sent special pioneers, and uh, whole families have moved into these countries to serve where the need is greater. So that, in a very literal sense, Jehovah's Witnesses have been lending to the nations while they have not borrowed, and in fact, in some nations, they have been offered uh, financial help by the governments and have refused such help because the society does not want to be obligated to, to those governments. Now this is uh, what the prophet Isaiah foretold in the 61st chapter where he tells us about the anointing of Christ's followers with the Holy Spirit and then says they must rebuild the long-standing devastated places they will raise up the desolated places of former times, and they will certainly make new the devastated cities, the places desolate for generation after generation. And then he proceeds to say in verse 5, and strangers will actually stand and shepherd the flocks of you people, and foreigners will be your farmers and your vine dressers. Now, who are these foreigners and these vine dressers? These shepherds who are going to 
do the work in behalf of Jehovah's anointed. Who are they? Well, he indicates this in the very next expression where he says, as for you, the priests of Jehovah you will be called, the ministers of our God you will be said to be, the resources of the nations you people will eat, and in their glory you will speak elatedly about yourselves. Instead of your shame, there will be a double portion, and instead of humiliation, they will cry out joyfully over their share. Therefore, in their land, they will take possession of even a double portion, rejoicing to time indefinite is what will come to be theirs. That's uh, in verses 6 and 7, as you see in the 61st chapter of Isaiah. So the point is, it is apparent that Jehovah God is using others to work also. For the anointed remnant, it refers particularly to the spiritual feeding of all of uh, Jehovah's flock. They are the ones upon whom he has placed the obligation to see to it that the spiritual food is provided for all and distributed to all. And they specialize particularly in the spiritual feature of the matter. They're doing that at the headquarters of the society and through the branch organizations. And personally, those of the anointed remnant are planting and cultivating, ministering and preaching. But... Uh, they're so few in numbers and they're so weak in uh, physical powers and abilities. And they're therefore leaving work for others to do as uh, prefigured by the shepherds of our flock and by our farmers and by our vine dressers. And this is where this uh, great crowd of loyal other sheep come in. They are the strangers. They are the foreigners who have heard the name of Jehovah God proclaimed throughout the earth and they've responded. They have associated themselves with the anointed remnant and now Jehovah God is using them in his work to uh, back up the anointed remnant and they're doing everything they can to support the remnant in their spiritual activities. So truly this is a time of great blessing poured out for us at the hands of Jehovah God. We're living in an abundance. We're coming near to the culmination of summer, near to the end of the fi final uh, harvest, or uh, put another way, uh, to the time when there should be a final harvest. And when that time does come, we're not going to join Christendom in saying we're not saved because we are going to be saved because we'll have the spirituality which Jehovah God will discern in us and he will approve of our spirituality and for that reason he will protect us through the battle of Armageddon and carry us into his new order of things and there he will build a new spiritual system of things after Armageddon. So may we therefore realize the marvelous time in which we're living. Those of the remnant will try to be real priests of Jehovah genuine ministers of our God and as for you or the great crowd of other sheep do you prove to be yourselves uh, shepherds of our flock and our farmers and our vine dressers and I know that uh, this you will do I'm very appreciative of the opportunity that you've uh, extended to me and also the others that are accompanying me from Brooklyn to be with you on this fine occasion for the congregation and uh, express my warm personal love uh, for the congregation as such. I've been uh, coming to this part of Pennsylvania for a while, longer than all of you remember, and I've known some of you during all those years, and uh, it's a real blessing to be with you here this morning. We have uh, every reason to be <coughs> greatly encouraged and enthused in our ministry and our relationship to Jehovah. But uh, above all else, what uh, we have been endeavoring to say this morning in this long discussion of this matter of uh, what harvest time brings is that whoever we are, uh, young or old, long in the truth, 
new in the truth or newly interested in the truth, let us never go contrary to counsel from the Word of God, counsel from the Watchtower, and the other counsel that comes to us through Jehovah's uh, theocratic organization. But be responsive and be disciplined thereby. And in this way, continue as a congregation and as individuals in the congregation to be absolutely loyal <coughs> to our God Jehovah. That will be to his play, praise and uh, it will be to our eternal blessing. And may Jehovah <coughs> bless us all in our efforts to do that. I couldn't help but to call to mind an expression that is made by the prophet Isaiah as Brother Souter was recounting the tremendous increase in spiritual things in human creatures that are sitting here this afternoon. When it states in the 30th, 65th chapter of Isaiah, the 14th verse, Look, my servants will cry out joyfully because of the good condition of the heart. Does this not move us to appreciate that loyalty to Jehovah has been the result of this blessing on this congregation? But we have before us an opportunity to disclose loyalty as never before. And not to be like the enemy, where it says, but you yourselves will make our cries because of the pain of heart, and you will howl because of sheer breaking of spirit. That's the enemy. We're appreciative, Brother Souter, for having been with us 20 years later. 20 years hence, probably we'll find ourselves in such a position that we'll be able to glorify Jehovah in a greater way. We have had an unusual arrangement for the Surah spoke to us about an, hour, about an hour and 45 or 48 minutes. And maybe you have been a little tired. so. Before we go into the most important uh, session that Jehovah's Witnesses had, the Watchtower study, will you not rise? And a, a song that has been chosen is 64, so rise on your feet. And I personally invite you to remain with us for just about a, a half hour more as we discuss a very important biblical subject. Now, we want to sing number 64, Myriads of Brothers, to be sung with warm appreciation.
Will you be seated, please?